Yeah, we have any other resources. You know, they're all Oh, yeah, that was the last one. Okay, hello. This is meeting two of Computer Club or Programming Club. We're going to talk about programming competitions. Um, if you, uh, to like sign in for attendance reasons, go to dsuprog.club, go to the meetings tab, and then click on the programming competitions meeting. Also, if you already had that open, you need to refresh the page because we made some last minute changes. Okay. So, there are generally speaking <coughs> a roughly three types of competitions. You got code golf, where you write as little code as possible. Hackathons, where you just make something and programming competitions, which have the same naming problem as the computer club, and <laughs> these ones are just you solve problems in a time frame, and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly, and what we'll also do a mini version of. So first of all is Code Golf, which uh, is possibly most well known around here as being the type that Tom really doesn't like, because the main goal is just to decrease the amount of characters in your code. So here's an example of something that ideally will take in an input and make it all lowercase and then output that. Uh, and then this is what it looks like if you're doing code golf. As you can see, there is a bunch of weird stuff in here, like C caret 10 inside of a for loop as the condition. Um, and also C in main for some reason. I will not be talking about this very much today because it's kind of complicated and weird. Type 2 is hackathons. We do a lot of these here because they're good and fun. Um, one of the main ones is the MLH hackathon you'll eventually start seeing a bunch of ads for it around campus. Um, that's hosted by Major League Hacking, sponsored by Microsoft usually. Um, there's a bunch of like um, basically classes during that that teach you something they're probably sponsored to teach you but also help you out a lot in making something that isn't just a command line app. Um, also the clubs Various computer clubs will be doing some variations on hackathons. Uh, another main one is the Sanford Health Hack, which I think they're still doing this year. Um, and this one's not as focused on like the code side of things. They really just want good ideas. So they really focus on trying to get people from a bunch of different backgrounds to try to figure out how to do something health related. And like, you don't even need a working final product to do well in it. Also, there's a pretty big cash prize for that one. Also, a popular type of hackathon that we don't really do at DSU much, but there's a bunch online, is Game Jams, where you make a game based on a prompt. Um, one of the biggest ones is Ludum Dare, happens twice a year. The next one's October 1st. Um, there's a bunch on itch.io. There's pretty much always multiple going on at the same time. Uh, and also there's a one hour game jam, which is mostly just a meme, but it's pretty fun. And that's every weekend uh, for one hour. Now, to the meat and potatoes of this presentation, programming competitions programming competitions. The two main ones that we go to that are like hosted outside of DSU are DigiKey and ACM's ICPC, the Intercollegiate Programming Competition. Um, and so DigiKey is one that we've won the last three years primarily because everyone else uses Java and we use C, and that's pretty useful for programming competitions. Um, 
and DigiKey has, um, let's see. Yeah, we need more people for DigiKey. So if you are thinking about wanting to do that, but didn't sign up yet, you can still sign up before Monday and have a pretty good chance of being on the team. Um, and that one's like the programming questions that I'll be talking about later and also some word problems. And I think that's it, but yeah. And that one does have various prizes, including like, I think it's Amazon gift cards, if you do well. And also like stuff like coasters and battery banks that are branded with DigiKey. Then ACM, ICPC, that one's a bunch of different events at different levels. We start with one coming up relatively soon here, usually in this exact room, even when East Hall is open, um, where we figure out who's, which teams are going to go to the regionals and the uh, other name that's similar to regionals, nationals, etc. Um, last year we got to the one that's a step up from regionals. The year previous we got to nationals well, a group from DSU, when I say we. Um, and yeah, this, this one is pretty much the benchmark for programming competitions. It's usually what I have in my head when I just say programming competition and I'm talking about them. Uh, and it'll also be fairly similar to the example one we'll be doing after the presentation. Oh, and this is DigiKey last year. We won that circle thing. So programming problems in a programming competition, they follow a fairly set um, formula, kind of. So I've brought up an example here. This is a fairly standard programming competition question and a fairly easy one. You can see the difficulty over here is 1.4, which is like 1 point, or 0 0.1 higher than the lowest difficulty. But they'll usually have some sort of usually quirky name, sometimes normal name, like this one. Um, then a description of the problem, as well as a more detailed description of the input that you'll be given and the output that you'll need to output. Uh, and this is just through the standard input and output. So with C, that would be uh, printf and scanf. Um, Python, it would be input and print. Uh, Java, println, etc. And you can use usually a wide variety of programming languages. For like ICPC, we usually just do C. Um, some or Python also is very common for this type of stuff. But if we go over this question specifically, uh, in the description you can see uh, it's a lot more uh, written out as like a story, not a story specifically, but it's a common problem in mathematics is to determine which quadrant a given point lies in. There are four quadrants numbered from one to four as shown in the diagram below. Then it has the diagram to give you context to what it's saying. Uh, for example, the point A, which is at coordinates, etc., is in point one since both x and y are positive, and point B is in quadrant two since x is negative and y is positive. Your job is to take a point and determine the quadrant it is in. You can assume that neither of the two coordinates will be zero. So this gives you quite a bit of information, but at the same time, it's not really the primary source of information when trying to solve the problem, because these will be much more useful to making sure that you're not like uh, slightly misinterpreting in a way that makes everything wrong. Um, so you can see on the input, 
the first line is one integer that's between negative 1,000 and 1,000, and it won't be zero. Um, these ranges are really important to keep track of in certain problems because sometimes they can be outside of the range of the size of a normal integer, and you got to account for things like that. Um, and then the second line is the same thing. And in this case, you do need to look at this part to see the context for what x and y are referring to. But sometimes all the information is in here. And then, so it gives you an x on one line, a y on the next line. And then you need to output the quadrant number 1, 2, 3, or 4 for the x, y point. So in this case, we look at this and we go, okay, I'm giving a, I'm, I've been given a coordinate pair, and then uh, just got to figure out what quadrants it's in. And this line here kind of gives all the context you need if you didn't already figure it out, which is just, are, is the first number positive or negative? If it's positive, it's in one of these two. If it's in negative, it's one of these two. Is the second number positive or negative? Etc. So in this case, uh, the solution is to just read in two numbers as two separate variables. Uh, let's call them x and y because that's what they're called here. And then if x is greater than zero, um, then nest in that if y is greater than zero, print one. If y is less than zero, print four, etc., etc just a bunch of if statements and prints. And then if you do that and don't mess up, you should get this. And so once you know that, you can type it out in really anything, any programming environment. And if you're on Caddis, you'll have an option to drag and drop your file or upload the file by clicking on here, or you can just type it straight in here if you want to try to freehand without testing. And then you can see there are very many languages that you can use. So this is actually also a pretty good tool for learning a new language, making sure you know all the things you need to know in that language, like all the different um, I forgot the word for it. Oh well like grammar but for code. So anyways, once you submit something there, and actually I'll just submit garbage right now, it'll take you to a different screen that will tell you whether or not you have submitted garbage after a second here. Yeah, so right here you can see there, it got a compile error. It tells you the error because it's nice. And then you can edit if you made just like a small typo, or you can go back and look over the problem again. A lot of the times, it'll say that you um, got one of the test cases wrong, or just like like test case 57 was wrong or something like that. And usually in that case, it's an edge case that you weren't accounting for. For example, if this problem had allowed for zeros, as either the x or y, then that would be pretty bad for what I just described because uh, zero anything isn't on a quadrant, so it would require a different output. Um, in this case, there isn't anything specifying that because it doesn't have zero, but it probably would have had a special case for if it did. Um, let's see. How far back is this? Here we go. And second problem, real quick, just wanted to show this one because it's kind of fun. Solving for carrots. You can read this part to yourself, but basically it talks about carrots a bunch and then says that there's a contest that's giving out awards for problems. Um, the input two numbers on a single line. First number is the number of contestants. Second number 
is the number of problems that were solved. And then on the, on the rest of it, there is n lines where n is the first number, each consisting of a single non-empty line in which the contestant describes him or herself. You may assume that the contestants are good at describing themselves in such a way that an arbitrary five-year-old with hearing problems could understand it. Now, something you may have noticed is uh, that last part doesn't really make sense. And that's because you don't actually need that last part to solve this problem. It's entirely a red herring used to demonstrate the fact that you don't necessarily have to use all of the information given to solve the problem. There's a lot of stuff where it gives either too much information or just some weird amount of information, but your main focus should just be on what is the desired outcome, what am I given, how can I get the desired outcome from any of this And, yeah. So, so, basically, the solution to this one is just printing out the second number, because that's, because the number of people who solve problems is the number of awards that are given out. And you can kind of see that here. The second number is the output. And sometimes you can use the sample input and output to quickly check to see if a hunch could be right about something being easier than you expected. Let's see, I think this is the last slide before we start the competition. And that is some basic strategy for programming competitions. The first one is team dynamic. Usually, in a programming competition, you only have one keyboard, but you've got like three people. So you really got to divide the work in a way that's efficient. Uh, something that we have found to be a good solution is you've got one person typing up problems, another person writing down, or I'll rephrase. You've got uh, two people writing down just in pseudocode on paper solutions to problems and then one person typing up those problems as they're being solved. Um, that tends to be relatively efficient, and then the person that's typing can also solve some on the side in between when the other people are working on it. Part two, time management. Um, the main thing with this is picking problems to do first and making sure you're not wasting time on a problem that you ultimately just give up on because you thought it might be easy and then it wasn't easy and yeah this has happened to me a lot um, also algorithms they're good things to know there's a lot of problems in especially as you get higher up uh, difficulty a decent number of problems are basically just, hey, implement this algorithm, but they don't tell you to do that. They just give you a problem that's easily solved by an algorithm. So as you get into like data structures and advanced data structures, uh, pay attention in those classes because some of those things are pretty useful for these situations. Hey, it's competition time. This is, um, click on this link, and, uh, yeah, you got to set up an account for Caddis. Um, I'd recommend using your DSU email. You can sign in with, like, GitHub or something. Um, I think if you use your DSU email to sign in, it'll put you on the leaderboards to, there's, like, all the different schools have their own leaderboard. DSU's somewhere in there. Also, um, you need to authorize people to get in because I've got a spectator right now. Oh, okay. I would like to participate. I would not like to spectate. Uh, yeah, you um, gotta, there's a button on the page so that says join the contest once you're spectating. Yeah, 
When you first click on the link, if you do not have an account made yet, uh, go up to the top right corner and click log in. And then there should be an option to create an account there at the bottom, I think. Um, let me double check that. And now, click log in. Um, and now, and click log in for email, and then sign up for a Caddis account. And then from there, you should be able to enter your credentials. And now, on my screen, you can see one of the more entertaining parts of a programming competition, which is watching the scoreboard as your name goes up and down and green and red boxes appear as people try and fail and succeed at problems. No one's done anything yet, but it just started, so. Anybody need help with logging in? And I will now stop the recording. Uh, because this will be boring for viewers online.